Okay. So while uh, Dick gets ready, so let's start the first session of the workshop. Uh, the first session before the coffee has uh, two talks. First by uh, Dick Bond and then by Ben Wandelt. Um, Dick will talk about, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Instabilities and irregularities during inflation and beyond, something like that was the title. Title. Yeah, so title has suddenly like inflated. <laughs> okay, so I'll leave Dick to it. My plan here, because I did a somewhat more general lecture at the beginning of, uh, of last week, was to completely plunge you into the deep end of uh, the arcana of uh, inflation and post-inflation to talk about non-Gaussianity. But uh, my good friend Shuba said, well, it would be better if it was related to CMB and LSS. And so I'm going to take an excursion in that and show where we're at in terms of looking at those things. Uh, the goal is uh, uh, seeing other measures of non-Gaussianity from the ultra early universe, novel large scale structures, CMB non-Gaussianities, and invariably, these are associated with instabilities and entropy generation during, believe it or not, and after inflation, if you look at it right. So the symbol there is S for entropy. It also looks like zeta, which is the measure of uh, adiabatic fluctuations that you should all know and love if you don't. But I'm going to cross talk with the generating fully uh, correlated non-Gaussian, what we call Websky map ensembles for CMB and LSS probes, which brings it right to the forefront of what we're trying to find in the next generation of uh, experiments, in particular the large-scale structure experiments. So I've worked on uh, this topic and uh, this with a large number of people at CETA. And uh, the subtext is varieties of primordial non-Gaussianity and how to search for them. Uh, but we have a group that's funded by the Simons Foundation. We are called the modern inflation people. The people that do bounces somehow do not have modern in their title. Um, anyway, that was a joke. But, uh, uh, so it's us. And then Eva Silverstein has a different way of trying to go after it, but with somewhat the same goal in mind and her collaborators. And Dan Green, another way to try and go after this. So we've got these different methodologies, and the goal is to try and do, a, 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 to push and pull on the possibilities from inflation. Because at the moment, we aren't getting very much information uh, from inflation. Okay, and the interesting aspect is uh, the non-Gaussianity can be, for a while I kept rejecting this, and now I've completely embraced it. It is intimately associated with the generation of particles in uh, the early universe if you interpret particle creation in the right way, and we think we are. Um, and so uh, part of this is related to the, you know, nothing less than the origin of the observed entropy in the universe in the standard model of particle physics. Uh, particles. Um, I described in the general lecture something about um, the split of the system into a coarse grain condensate breaking up into fine grain fluctuations. That does correspond to particle creation. If there's an instability, that does not create non Gaussianity by itself. It can still be an adiabatic process. But if you stretch parameter space, then eventually you stretch it to the breaking point, and that's the point where uh, it's, uh, you can create a whole bunch of particles, and that can create non-Gaussianity. Uh, and within the context of inflation itself, uh, you can get the same phenomena that you occur at the, can occur at the end of inflation. This is uh, episodic stretching, which is adiabatic, as I said, and breaking, which is non-adiabatic, leading to non-Gaussianity. So we think that this is a pretty general framework. We've been working on it for a ridiculously long period of time, uh, but uh, it gets richer and richer. The methodology that we're using, apart from you know analytics and semi-analytics and all of that, is a nonlinear multi-field. It's a nonlinear multi-field classical coupled system, and uh, we evolve using lattice simulations. 
And for some of the things, we have to have arbitrary accuracy. And so uh, we have different ways of doing this. One is a sort of more conventional um, lattice or grid-based approach. The other one goes back and forth in the pseudo-spectral aspect with a certain amount of wave number information coming in. Turns out to be really effective for some of the things we look at. This gives us very high accuracy. So I've been working on these things for quite a while in terms of a phenomenology of what might come out of inflation, um, uh, going way back to uh, uh, the late 80s with Salopec and Bardeen, and then we did a bunch of uh, early non-Gaussianity work, and it's continued since then. And a very, uh, an idea which I would like to get across is that what we're in effect doing in many respects is calculating response functions. Uh, we are calculating how power spectra for fields for this uh, quantity zeta, which is characterizing the level of adiabatic fluctuations and the endpoint functions, are um, responding to variations in the form of the potential. Okay, so then uh, uh, what you get during inflation by these sorts of methods, you get something which is different than usual non-Gaussianity, which is spread out across k-space. You can get nonlinear k-space burst structure, which is a very different thing to look for within the data than, uh, than the way it's been done in Planck. And then after inflation ends, uh, you have to connect really small scales, a co-moving centimeter, to make um, something that's observable on very large scales, but that is just totally natural. It's modulated by fields that are present as long as they're light. And um, if you want to connect to large-scale structure, you actually have to marginalize over about 50 e-folds of sub-large-scale structure. It's a very beautiful theory. Um, and we put the whole framework of all of this now into a relationship of dynamical system theory using Kolmogorov sinai entropy and a true entropy, Shannon's entropy. Shannon's entropy, you probably know something about, but you may not know about it at the kind of important level that it needs to be at. Um, uh, anyway, uh, non-Gaussianity particle production is in fact relatable to the Shannon entropy generation. I um, had described here some equations, but we're going to skip over that. Now, if you ask yourself, well, aren't we just dealing pie in the sky here? All of the fluctuations in energy, uh, in, um, in uh, densities that we are observing in the universe grew out of a response to the zeta, which is generated by all of this stuff. And the relationship between the initial zeta, which doesn't change in time, to, uh, at least in linear theory, to, for example, the log of the density fluctuations, is through a response function, a susceptibility, also known as a linear transfer function, something that you're really familiar with, but this is the uh, way that the system is described. Uh, geez, that doesn't come out very well which is probably a good thing. That means I can race through it and not talk about it. This is, uh, first of all, talking about what Planck 2015 and, and Planck, soon to be Planck 2018 non-Gaussianity, is going to reveal to you about the best we can do with the CMB right now on what you would call perturbative non-Gaussianity, where you have a Gaussian part and a correlated non-Gaussian part, and they are, uh, because of the correlation between them and the patterns that they develop, we can place really strong constraints. But as soon as you say that the non-Gaussian part might be not correlated or only weakly correlated with the Gaussian part, then the sky's the limit in terms of what's available. And that changes and relaxes the um, constraints that you can draw from data. Uh, this is just a reminder of the many things that we've gotten from Planck, and we will, this will be updated. Um, in, uh, it's a, it was supposed to be a 2018 paper, and a, it, as is not unusual with the Planck, it's a 2019 paper. Um, anyway, there are lots of possibilities here, which I'll get into, but this is a sort of too densely packed. Okay, so now I am going to, uh, this is one of the things that was the centerpiece of what I tried to get at in the sort of more general lecture um, last Tuesday, which is the topography and cartography 
of the ultra early universe that we can draw by basically Wiener filtering given the temperature and the E mode of polarization. This is what it looks like. Again, uh, there's something wrong with the uh, way things get uh, displayed here, so this is not seen in all its glory. Uh, it's really like a Gaussian random field, but it takes away the baryon acoustic oscillations because they aren't part of the uh, initial structure. And then there are these sort of anomaly regions. This is the famous cold spot, which is a 15-bit excursion from Gaussianity, which is a non-trivial thing. That's a 4.5 sigma. So it's the most egregious of the, it is famous, right? It's the, but it's the most egregious of the deviations. These deviations are really low L, and so uh, sample variance makes it hard. Uh, just for fun, just rotate the sky, because you all know, and everybody's always focused on this region for the cold spot and the anomalies. But if you just rotate around, so this is the plane of the galaxy, this is the way the cold spot looks, not that you, know, you can go into the depths of it and all that. So it's not exactly a little round bit, right? It's got structure and all of that, which is supposed to be built. One of the things about Planck 2018 is that the full power of E polarization allows us to check how the polarization is doing on this. But the trouble with that is that it just turns out that the, in the relevant scales, the E is not very powerful, so we don't draw a lot. But the prediction in a, is that if there's a 4.5 sigma deviation in temperature and it's derived from something underlying associated with zeta, then uh, it would be about a 2.2 sigma fluctuation. And so you'd be trying to deal with that plus fluctuations on it, so it will never be a you know smoking gun or shouldn't unless it's uh, completely different. Um, how do you deal with a cold spot? Well, one way is to say, as I referred to, there is the possibility of uncorrelated uh, non-Gaussianity relative to the uh, largest thing. So this is a, a Gaussian realization, and this would be the kind of thing that you might get from a subdominant non-Gaussian thing. In fact, we actually get it from simulations. Uh, this one has been arranged, so you know, sort of one in 10 times, you draw and you can get um, a, a positive uh, interference between here and here that boosts up your Gaussian random cold spot and makes it into a more powerful one that uh, satisfies non-Gaussianity. I'm not saying that's the solution. I'm saying that that can and will happen with these intermittent, we call them, uh, patterns of non-Gaussianity. Key point here is that you see fluctuations everywhere. Here, you see the fluctuations are much more localized, and that means that the way you're trying to look for it is completely different than the way Planck 2018 non-Gaussianity looks for it. Um, I'm not going to emphasize this. I played with this a lot on last Tuesday, but it encapsulates um, all of the information about what we've drawn from the early universe from Planck, including the uh, the bicep Keck data with the gravity wave spectrum, uh, not plotted on here is the less than 2%, even for some cases it's 1.3%, isocurvature mode constraints, which are uh, perpendicular to the zeta constraint. So we get a really fantastic result over the observable range, then of course you don't get very much here. The reason I'm showing this is that this is uh, one megaparsec inverse, right? So that's actually even pushing a bit into, um, you know, details of the galaxy formation thing. And if we go way over here, there's lots of unconstrained room. In other words, we could end up with a zeta spectrum that has a huge burst over here, and we wouldn't know about it, except if maybe it produced lots of primordial black holes or something. So there's a lot of possibility of heavy uh, modifications that can occur just in the power spectrum. So um, we have this program at CETA in which we're um, trying to look at all of these possibilities in some kind of grand unified framework. Uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about now is uh, uh, after I do my CMB LSS excursion is uh, the kind of fluctuations you can get after inflation, but the thing that we've been having a lot of fun with recently is that um, it, the zeta diagram that I showed you, 
the relevant region is way up here. And this is down getting close to the end of preheating. And we're targeting sort of regions like this. It can be anywhere here. And we're making structures associated with that, associated with changes in the potential surface and trying to see what the response is. Completely wide open in terms of, uh, of uh, inflation. So there's a lot of room to try and look for things if we can do it. OK, so now I'm going to briefly talk about the web skis. So the idea is that we're making, uh, we have a sort of a, a mini industry. This began in the 90s when the first thing we were trying to do, we were trying to mock every experiment imaginable. And after all these years, that's what I'm still trying to do. The interesting thing is that every uh, probe is correlated with every other probe. And you have to take that into account. That's generally not been done in the history of large-scale structure. Now we have no choice because the amounts of sky are so large. OK, so this is uh, you know, just some patterns, optical, uh, kinetic Sinaya Zoltovich, thermal Sinaya Zoltovich, uh, cosmic infrared background. This is weak lensing. Interesting thing is that weak lensing actually goes in front of all of these things and distorts it. We're now into the throes of that, so it isn't just that weak lensing has an impact on the CMB primary. It's got impact on every single one of these. If you don't take them into account, you have not done a good ensemble uh, to try and test the data with. Um, here's some uh, neat things associated with intensity mapping. Uh, we're really into chime at, uh, in Canada, uh, but also we're into CO map and hopefully C2 mapping and other uh, line intensity mapping things. All of these can be used to try and look for non-Gaussianity. I talked about the microwave background. Oh, you can't see this at all. This is uh, a Gaussian beginning for a thermal Sinai of Zeldovich calculation. And this is uh, uh, with a subdominant uncorrelated component. You really can't tell very much. But what happened here is that this cluster got booted up a little bit just by random chance of, of the alignment of the uncorrelated signals. And then there are other cases. But you can't really see that. So I'm going to show you this in a, what I really like, um, is in terms of uh, a CO and a CIB way of looking at it at much higher redshift. Of course, the trouble with high redshift is you've got gastrophysical complexity ad nauseum. But this is sweeping through in redshift space, that is, say, through the line of, uh, in this case, CO 1 to 0. CIB, you don't get the tomography. You don't get the redshift information. You can do some things by cross-correlation. But this is sweeping through it. And you can see that, well, if you look at it with some care, there, there is coherence as you pass through, which there should be, in the redshift direction. And of course, spatially in the angular direction as well. And then what happens here is highly correlated with what happens here. Um, and similarly with H1 and whatever other signal you have. Uh, the trouble with the CO mapping, which is 2.4 to 3.4, is the amount of sky we're going to get isn't so large. So it's not the ideal thing to look for primordial non-Gaussianity. You want big sky. A good thing to look at is uh, chime. Chime is doing a really large volume of sky over the redshift range uh, 0.8 to 2.5 in H1. And it turns out that that's actually a really good thing to do in terms of non-Gaussianity. So this shows the kind of thing you get. This is a Gaussian zeta initial conditions. And this is uh, an uncorrelated thing that would be superimposed upon this. So look at how sporadic it is. This is from a after inflation realization of non-Gaussianity. So this and this, and this is with no correlation. So then, um, this is a movie, the movie I showed you before, and it shows a difference movie of a standard FNL uh, correlated Gaussianity with FNL of 10. And this is a, an example of this intermittent uh, non-Gaussianity, and it just shows you, um, you won't look at this in detail, but the, there are a lot more colors here, <laughs> um, that there is a much bigger signal that can be there for the intermittent non-Gaussianity relative to the correlated one, because this is already ruled out by the Planck data, that value of FNL. Um, can we do this later? They've got me on a tough clock. Um, OK, I will uh, ex 
like to have spent a lot more time on the joys of the after inflation generation of, uh, of fluctuations because we have a whole beautiful theory in which it's like we're generating a line structure associated with things that naturally occur associated with instability, and we've done a lot of work with this. Um, and um, the only thing that I will say is that you're all used to density bias, which is the biasing of clusters or galaxies, et cetera. There is an analog of bias here, and the bias, though, is operating on zeta. Zeta's got the same kind of power spectrum as the gravitational potential, which means that you are not dealing with that short distance object stuff. You're doing a huge modulation over very large scales. And so it, and it's one of the reasons you saw those kind of intermittent patterns of things where not much happens and then suddenly you get this little burst of power. But as I said, I, I, really fun things, but we're going to skip over it uh, in terms of entropy production. And I'm going to focus right now on, this is our classic potential for inflation, quantum diffusion drift. Uh, we're trying to completely improve that joint thing, which is stochastic inflation, by including all of the nonlinearities, extremely weak level, that join the two things together. And we're doing this with this uh, pseudospectral code. And one of the key ingredients is what is the system doing uh, associated with perpendicular directions to the general inflaton flow? Uh, generically, we're calling these chi. And once you open up that, many, many things are uh, possible. So we decided during inflation to approach this like a numerical experiment. And uh, with the concept of in states and out states and a uh, potential structure, which for an sort of unperturbed potential is really simple, but um, we're making uh, features so that um, in particular, you see this, this is bent down here. That is an M squared effective, mass squared effective negative. That's an instability. So this system here, as you roll down, is unstable. And then the question is, what do you do to complete the instability? Does it go back to some kind of flow here, right down the inflaton direction? Or can interesting things happen? And the answer is, interesting things can happen. And so we've been treating this like a numerical experiment. We set up the fluctuations here and the, uh, the large-scale structure of, uh, of the inflaton fields. And then we measure what comes out here, and we do the differencing between the case where there is no instability. You can chain these instabilities together and you get all sorts of interesting phenomena like oscillations in power spectra that you can also see in non-Gaussianity, and that has been looked at in the Planck data. So this is just M squared showing that we've uh, made things so that it goes negative and then positive to stabilize, and the critical element is negativity means that you've got instability. What is the response to that? It's k-localized because we put this structure on the potential. So what we get out is a burst of zeta power. So these are, this is the two-point power in, uh, in zeta. And so you can see that you can go along and you, know, you have this situation normal, standard p zeta, the standard thing, you know, maybe fit by just uh, constant uh, ns, et cetera. And then somewhere, a burst appear appears. So what do you do with the burst? If the burst is not in the observable location, let's say it's at uh, 1,000 megaparsec inverse, we don't know about that. We don't know anything about that. We haven't constrained it at all. The only thing that you constrain is if the burst is large enough, you could get primordial black holes, and then that can be constrained. So, but this is interesting, but this is maybe even more interesting. You get a burst in three-point, which is related to the two-point you get a burst in the four point, which is related to the... Uh, so what I think there's a beautiful theory of is coherence of endpoint bursts, which has just not been explored in inflation so far, which gives lots of abilities to try and bring things together to maybe make much better ways of, um, of developing uh, uh, constraints. So that was example I gave you was uh, what we call uh, a chi light 
scenario so that the, uh, the that you had the ability to um, go long distances um, in the uh, transverse direction. This is a chi heavy where you actually have a large m squared. So what happens is that you come down the inflaton direction and if you do a deviation, it's trying to damp you down because m squared is positive in towards the trough. But then you hit an instability region and pardon the expression, all hell breaks loose. So you can do all sorts of interesting things. And then uh, you go back into the heavy situation. Uh, that's um, with an instability. You can tell it's an instability because it's bending down here. This part is flat. There is a whole theory worked on by my good friend Lev Kaufman, but by many other people, uh, in which this is flat, and that's called trapped inflation. I'm getting there. Okay, so for those classes of calculations, it's the same story again. Just draw attention here. This is a burst of two-point power that occurs. It looks different than the other one. That's important. And this is a burst of three-point power. So the same story goes with those sorts of things. So we've got this vision of uh, uh, numerical experiments. And where does that occur? There's, I, I told you very briefly that there was intimate relationship between particle production and entropy production. So this shows the entropy production in this particular case in zeta, which are also the phonons of the system that occur with these uh, experiments during inflation. So you come along and um, you know you have things sort of pretty normal. And then where the instability has occurred, you do this, this is a wave number band, you burst up uh, these uh, measures of phonon occupation or production which are measured by delta zeta. So we think we've made, if I do say so, a little bit of a breakthrough in how to think about this because the way it used to be done is that you would try and come up with some effective omega of t for the oscillators in order to do this and it just isn't as accurate as this method of uh, showing particle production. So we now have a vision which has got a lot of classicality in it H bar is still there because of quantum fluctuations, but um, that is, in my view, we think that we will teach our particle theory friends, including Nima Arkani Hamad, of a different way of thinking about multiparticle production. Okay, this is just more of the same. So the end point here, this is where we began. I showed you a few nice pictures. We still don't really know what the degrees of freedom are for the early universe. Uh, this is the mantra of what the whole thing is all about. Uh, what has not been done, and I referred to this Tuesday, was fitting into an ultraviolet complete theory or an infrared complete theory where we're connecting to the standard model of particle physics. What I went through was the role of instabilities after inflation, briefly, I must say, um, that lead to non-Gaussianity in a very understandable way. So we took that knowledge and we went back into the heart of inflation to say what would the role of instabilities there be. And once again, we set it up like a scattering theory experiment of in-states, out-states, and got non-Gaussianity. The topic that I would love to bend your ear on is what I'm most keen about, which is that instead of looking at the system in sort of a classical stochastic inflation way, I'm now looking at it in terms of coherent states for both uh, coarse grain condensate out of the horizon, outside of the horizon fluctuations, and the uh, oscillating fluctuations that are associated with H bar. Uh, there's a beautiful framework. And at that point, Shuba will be happy to see that word come up. <laughs>